So tonight's program, Progressive Reformers and Lesbian Lives, is um, being presented by us, the New York City LGBT Historic Sites Project, in partnership with the Henry Street Settlement, a great institution on the Lower East Side that you'll learn more about later in the program. My name is Amanda Davis, and I'm the project manager of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. Tonight's talk is the last um, of a three-part series that explores historic lesbian spaces in New York City. The first two talks, 1970s Lesbian Activism and Community and 20th Century Lesbian Life in Greenwich Village is now up on YouTube uh, in case you missed it or would like to see it again. Uh, we also wanna thank Humanities New York for sponsoring this series. Since this is the last program of the year for us, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what the project has achieved over the past year. We're a small group of historic preservationists who founded the project in 2015 to show the LGBT community's impact on American history and culture. Our website now features 300, 380 LGBT historic sites across the five boroughs of New York City, and we're continuing to add more. And I'll share a few sites that we added to the map in 2021. So you can find this map on our homepage. Um, in Harlem, Keith Haring's iconic Crack is Black mural, which he painted on the handball court in 1986 in response to the crack epidemic, which was then at its height in New York City. The Audre Lorde Project in Brooklyn, an important meeting space for queer groups of color, which has been in the parish house of Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church since 1996 and was named for Audre Lorde, the black lesbian poet whose home on Staten Island we feature on our website. A demonstration against LGBT harassment in the Flushing Meadows Corona Park Tree Grove, which several uh, gay and lesbian groups held in the summer of 1969 after a group of nearby Queens residents chopped down the trees as part of their campaign to harass gay men who cruised there. You can see the trees in that black and white photo chopped down. Club 82, one of the most prominent American clubs for female impersonators, as they were then called, uh, the most important, uh, one of the most prominent clubs of the day, which operated here from 1953 to 1973. The Harlem Supper Club, named for the internationally popular African-American cabaret singer, Jimmy Daniels, who also owned and operated the famed night spot from 1939 to 1942 on the ground floor of this building. And the new St. Mark's Bast, one of the largest and most renowned gay bathhouses in the city from 1979 to 1985, that became the subject of a battle against the closure of gay bathhouses during the early years of the AIDS epidemic. So these are just some of the sites we've added in 2021. Uh, and we encourage you to go to the website, to check out these and more. Uh, one of our favorite aspects of the website is our curated themes page, which currently features 33 collections. Some themes added in 2021 include bar raids and forced closures, homophobia and transphobia, the downtown art scene, literary New York, gay owned businesses, activism outside Manhattan, communities of color, and LGBT named public schools. So you can go to the site and click on any one of these or the other 33 and you'll see um, historic sites that tie into this theme to learn more. Just another way to explore the website. Our project also advocates for the designation of LGBT landmarks at the city, state, and national level. New York City currently has 10 of the 23 LGBT sites on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and we've supported other people's nominations in the past across the country and looking forward to that list expanding and across the state. Uh, in 2021, we successfully nominated two sites to the National Register, the Lorraine Hansberry Residence in Greenwich Village and the Women's Liberation Center in Chelsea. The Henry Street Settlement on the Lower East Side was listed on the National Register and was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1974. This past year, we've worked with the settlement staff to add an extra layer of significance to that listing by recognizing the two buildings where the settlement's founder, Lillian Wald, lived and worked. And you'll learn more about the LGBT connection later in the program. We're proud to share that this LGBT update to the listing was added to the New York State Register of Historic Places just last week. 
and it now moves on for national register consideration. Finally, this past year, we've continued to navigate the pandemic by offering a mix of in-person and virtual programs. We held a walking tour of Greenwich Village and we're hoping to offer more walking tours in 2022 and took part in another year of the Gay Greenwood Trolley Tour in Brooklyn. Virtual events like the ones we've held on gay photographer George Platt Lyons, lesbian business owner Eve Adams, and the First Act Up protest are available on our YouTube page and we're busy planning more programs for the new year. Now I'd like to introduce our two speakers tonight. First is Andrew Dolcart, one of our project directors and founders, who is also your go-to person for everything architectural history in New York City. He will be sharing his research into site associated with Boston marriages and progressive reformers with you tonight. He'll be followed by Katie Vogel, public historian for the Henry Street Settlement, who we're thrilled to have here tonight. Katie wrote this most recent National Register nomination for Walt's significance to the settlement, and she'll be sharing her extensive knowledge of the site with you tonight. All right. So thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. So this evening, we want to focus on progressive women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many of whom lived as romantic couples in what has been referred to as Boston marriages. This talk was planned many months ago, and it is a wonderful coincidence that we can give this presentation tonight as a celebration of the listing of the Henry Street Settlement House on the New York State Register of Historic Places. Henry Street, as Amanda just mentioned, was originally listed on the National Register as a National Historic Landmark in 1974, but largely for its importance as a settlement house in America, with, of course, some discussion of the significance of Lillian Wald. But what this new nomination, referred to as the Lillian Wald residence, does is to focus not only on her social work achievements, but on the homosocial world of women that she created at Henry Street and on her romantic relationships, as Katie Vogel will discuss in a little while. Wald exemplifies the affluent, educated, professional women whom I will be focusing on. The latter part of the 19th century saw a significant shift in opportunities for a certain class of affluent women as educational opportunities opened for them and as certain professions outside of teaching attracted their attention. Many, although not all of the women that we will discuss this evening were college graduates. A few came from, from affluent families and were educated as children, but chose not to attend college. Only a few rose from the working class. The second half of the 19th century saw rapid advancements in women's education well beyond the earlier 19th century female seminaries where mostly affluent women were trained to be mothers, charitable benefactors, and supporters of the church. Or if they were single, to be school teachers, a job that women left once they married. In 1865, Vassar was established as the first academically rigorous women's college, followed in 1875 by Wellesley and Smith, and then a succession of other all women's colleges. And of course, there were also coeducational schools as well, such as Oberlin, Antioch, and Bates. In 1900, there were about 85,000 women enrolled in undergraduate programs and 5,237 received degrees. And I love this picture of the Vassar baseball team here uh, on, on the left. And you can see a, an early class at Wellesley. Many of the women who graduated from college had no interest in marriage. The marriage statistics for graduates from leading women's colleges are quite striking. According to one source, of every 1,000 graduates of Radcliffe between 1907 and 1916, only 514 married. At the other end of the scale, at Vassar, the statistic was 700 marriages per 1,000 graduates, still a substantial number of unmarried women. The statistics for other women's colleges fall somewhere between those for Radcliffe and Vassar. These numbers were well below the statistics for all women in America at the time. Thus, there were a substantial number of unmarried graduates. Many of these women were seeking work, but in a market which continued to discriminate. A few did get medical or law degrees, but many went into professions such as social work, education, labor reform, and the arts, which welcomed women at least up to a point. Women became pioneers in these fields as leading thinkers and theoreticians 
and most importantly, as activists. They were among the most significant figures in progressive reform, establishing important settlement houses, funding schools with innovative educational curriculums, and establishing or running organizations that fought for labor reform, civil rights, suffrage, and other progressive era issues. These unmarried professional women tended to settle in urban centers such as New York, and as one might expect, sought each other out. Many relationships, often deeply romantic, developed among this group of women. These relationships have come to be known as Boston marriages. That is, a relationship between two cohabitating women. Evidence in letters, diaries, and other sources makes it clear that many of these relationships were of a romantic nature. But in most cases, we do not know anything about the physical relationships between these women. Today, we would call many of these women who lived in romantic partnerships lesbians, but this is not a term that they would have used since this word, when used at all, was used in reference only to working class women. The term Boston marriage was apparently in use by the late 19th century. It derives from Henry James's 1885 to 86 novel, initially published in serial form in Century Magazine, that focuses on two unmarried women who live together. James modeled the couple after his sister Alice and Catherine Loving, and after his friends, poet Sarah Orne Jewett and her companion, Annie Fields. And just as an aside, I want to mention that the Sarah Orne Jewett House, which is owned by Historic New England in Berwick and is located in Berwick, Maine, was one of the very first houses in America to interpret the same sex relationship between the two people who live there. And Historic New England has really been a pioneer uh, in, in, in this uh, recent development. So let's look at some of these progressive women in New York City and their achievements. And you will note the lives of these women often overlapped as many were friends and or companions in reform efforts. You will also note that many, in fact, almost all of them are associated with Greenwich Village. The village was welcoming to diverse groups of people and these women, especially those in romantic relationships, felt comfortable in the area. But it is important to note that these women should not be confused with the Bohemians for which the village became famous in the early 20th century. These were not the poor budding artists and writers and activists seeking the cheap rents that could be found in old cold water village buildings. These were more affluent women who could afford to rent well-appointed apartments or purchase a unit in a co-op. Education was one of the first professional fields in America that brought large numbers of women into the workforce. What changed during the progressive era is that women became leaders in educational reform including founders of some of the most progressive schools in the country. Elizabeth Irwin exemplifies these women. She was born into a wealthy family in Brooklyn, attended Packer Collegiate Institute for Girls, now Packer Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn Heights, and then went to Smith. In the early 20th century, she began work to rethink the curriculum for public elementary schools in New York and in the early 1920s was able to implement her so-called Little Red Schoolhouse reforms at PS61 on East 16th Street and later at PS41 on West 11th Street. Budget cuts and a decided lack of support from male public school administrators threatened her reforms. And despite the active support of Eleanor Roosevelt, the school program closed. But a group of parents persuaded her to start her own private school, the Little Red Schoolhouse, in a building that had been erected in 1918 by the First Presbyterian Church as an unsuccessful mission to the local Italian community. At first, uh, they were given space here, and then eventually they bought this building. The school then later expanded both physically and in its curriculum, adding a high school component in 1940. The philosophy at Little Red was that education needed to be social and interactive with students learning from experience and lessons that should reflect how they lived and interacted in their communities. The teaching focused on hand-on education rather than on rote learning. And this still is really the, the, the belief behind uh, this, this really prominent uh, Greenwich Village school today. Irwin lived at 23 Bank Street with her partner, Catherine Anthony, a writer, who specialized in biography, including best-selling studies of Catherine the Great, Queen Elizabeth, 
and Marie Antoinette. And I should note that many of these sites that we're going to discuss today are on our website. Uh, this, uh, this building, for example, is. But others we haven't quite gotten to yet. So we haven't done the Bank Street House uh, that, that uh, Irwin shared with Anthony. An equally significant educational reformer was Carolyn Pratt founder of the City and Country School, now on West 12th and 13th Streets. Pratt came from rural upstate New York and became a school teacher at the age of 16, which gives you some idea of how little training uh, the, the average school teacher in America had uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. She went on to study at Teachers College in New York, but was frustrated with their traditional curriculum and was equally frustrated teaching at a normal school, that the normal schools were schools that, that trained teachers. And she taught at a normal school outside of Philadelphia, but it, she felt that it had a really constricted curriculum. In response, she moved to New York City to establish her own school where children would learn by doing and where their innate curiosity would result in a desire to learn new things. Pratt was, pro, was a proponent of learning through creative play and invented educational toys and was and specifically focused on what she referred to as unit blocks. Then these are the construction blocks that probably all of us played with as kids, the, rec, the cubes and rectangles and cones uh, that you can see the, the children building with um, here. Uh, they also, uh, as, as part of the, the learning by doing, for example, rather than sitting and doing rote mathematical projects, she formed the students into a bank and they learned math by basically running a little mini bank. After occupying several small spaces, the school moved to 165 West 12th Street in 1921 and now occupies seven row houses and teaches, and teaches children from ages two to 13. Her life partner was Helen Merritt, a leading labor reformer who we, who we will get back to in a few minutes. They lived at 252 West 12th Street from 1928 until their deaths. And we have just added both the 12th Street House and the city and country school uh, to, our, our, to the website. A third educational reformer, also a resident of Greenwich Village, was Marion Dickerman, who lived at 141, at 171 West 12th Street with her partner, Mary Cook. Dickerman, whom you see on the right, eventually became the head of the Todd Hunter School, a progressive, College Preparatory School for Wealthy Women, Wealthy Girls, located in a row house on the Upper East Side, which you can see here on the left. The school had a strong emphasis on the arts and was a college preparatory school. The school was named for its founder, Winifred Todd Hunter, with Dickerman as vice principal. When Eleanor Roosevelt learned that Todd Hunter wanted to leave the school, she assisted in its sale to Dickerman. Roosevelt taught at the school, including organized field trips to tenement districts and courthouses so that the wealthy students could get a broader understanding of the diversity of lived experiences in the city. And it's just amazing that Eleanor Roosevelt, at the time when she was first lady of New York State, was actually teaching uh, the, the, these uh, classes at the Todd Hunter School. In 1939, Todd Hunter merged with Dalton, a school that was founded by Helen Parkhurst, another major educational reformer who, after leaving Dalton, lived the last 17 years of her life with Dorothy Rawls Luke, who was also an educator. And this was something I knew nothing about, um, that this early history of Dalton, until I was putting together this talk uh, over the last few days. And we'll, we'll be sure to add a site uh, for, for Parkhurst and Dalton. Marion Dickerman and the Todd Hunter School give us entry into the social world of progressive women in the circle of Eleanor Roosevelt, who first rented an apartment in Greenwich Village at 171 West 12th Street, where Esther Lapp, a labor reformer, and her partner, Elizabeth Reed, an early woman, woman attorney, uh, lived. Beginning in 1942, Roosevelt kept the pied a terre at 29 Washington Square West, apartment 15A. Dickerman and her partner, Nancy Cook, lived nearby on 12th Street. Cook, whom you see on the far right in this picture, was the head of the women's division of the State Democratic Committee, through which she met Roosevelt. The three women built Stone Cottage in Hyde Park and established the Val Kill Furniture Company. And here you can see Stone Cottage, which is where uh, Dickerman and Cook lived. And, and, and then 
uh, later became part of, of Eleanor Roosevelt's complex uh, here. And they're picnicking on the grounds of, of, of Valkyll uh, here. And here's the furniture factory, which Cook was the major person behind. She had always wanted to be a furniture designer. Uh, and she was responsible for this uh, company that basically revived early American furniture, but also employed a lot of local, uh, lot of local people. Living at the same address as Dickerman and Cook on 12th Street, in fact, supposedly across the hall from Dickerman and, and Cook, was another couple in the Roosevelt orbit, Mary Dusin and Polly Porter. Molly Dusin became friends with Roosevelt through her work with the New York Consumers League, where she and Roosevelt advocated for, limit, for limiting the working hours of women to 48 hours a week and also fought for a minimum wage. Dusin became Dusin became the head of the women's division of the Democratic National Committee, and her biographer refers to her as, quote, America's first female political boss. She lived at 12th Street with Polly Porter, an heir to the international harvester fortune who supported Dusin, but didn't, wasn't an act, actually an activist herself. Roosevelt and Dusin were caught up in a wave of advocacy for labor reform especially surrounding issues of women industrial workers. Labor reform attracted many progressive women. This was especially true around an organization known as the New York Women's Trade Union League, where two women, each involved in lifelong relationships with another woman, were leaders. Mary Dreyer was born into a wealthy Brooklyn family and did not go to college. Rather, she plunged into reform work. She was active in the huge shirtwaist industry strike of 1909, known as the Uprising of the 20,000. And she is, um, she's in this picture. And I believe that this is Mary Dreyer um, over here. She was active in the, um, while picketing a shirtwaist factory, Dreyer was arrested. When the magistrate realized that she was a wealthy supporter and not a worker, he immediately dismissed the case. Dreyer publicized this action since it exemplified the discrimination in treatment of poor working women who were victimized by the police and the judicial system. I don't think this magistrate knew what he was getting into when he dismissed her case. Dreyer eventually became disillusioned with the sexism in the labor movement, although many of the activists were women, most of the union leaders were men. And she moved on to advocating for reform legislation and working for, suffrage, work for the suffrage movement. She was also active in the Black Civil Rights Movement and attended the national meeting that led to the founding of the NAACP. And she also served on the New York Factory Investigating Commission that followed the tragic Triangle Waste Company fire that killed uh, about 150 mostly women uh, in, in, in a factory. She was also a mentor to Rose Schneiderman and Pauline Newman, two powerful lesbian labor leaders who rose through the ranks from factory workers. And Schneiderman and Newman, who are all, also have not yet been uh, added to our, our website, were among the rare examples of people who became leaders in the labor movement and actually rose from the working class uh, to become, to become uh, labor leaders. Uh, and this was rarely true of women. Dreyer's partner was Francis Keller, um, whom you can see uh, here, Keller is on the left. This is this looks like a uh, what at the time would have been referred to as a a, a butch femme relationship with the uh, with, with with Keller in her tweeds and and um, Dreyer in her uh, fancier outfit. Uh, Keller used her college education to rise out of poverty uh, from her childhood. She was also involved with labor reform and was especially active in the civil rights movement in the early 20th century. In 1901. She wrote a book called The Criminal Negro, a book that argued that criminality among Black Americans was not hereditary as it was generally believed, but that was the result of environmental conditions such as poverty and poor educational opportunities. Now, we take these ideas for granted, but this was so radical in 1901 uh, when, when, when Keller wrote her book. Dreyer and Keller are buried together in the Dreyer family plot at Greenwood Cemetery. Sadly, very few of the queer couples whom we discuss on our site are buried together. One couple that is buried together is Carrie Chapman Catt and Mary Garrett Hay, like Dreyer, leaders in the suffrage movement. Catt was president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association 
and led the movement in its final push for voting rights. And Hay was a leader in the organization of parades and street rallies that led to the passage of the New York State Suffrage Amendment in 1917. They are buried together at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, and their gravestone reads, here lie two united in friendship for 38 years through constant service to a great cause. And you'll notice, of course, the, the pair of rainbow flags. And that's because when we do our Greenwood and Woodlawn tours, we plant rainbow flags at all of, of the sites that we discuss, inspired by the veterans uh, who put US flags at, at grave sites. Uh, and if you come on one of our tours, you'll find how moving this is uh, to, to plant these rainbow flags. Another key labor reformer was Carolyn Pratt's partner, Helen Merritt, who was also involved with the Women's Trade Union League and like Dreyer, marched during the 1909 strike. And there's that same picture again. And I believe that this is Helen Merritt, third from the right. She also served on the Post Triangle Fire Committee and went on to help organize women into the bookkeeper, stenographers, and accountants union. She then served on the editorial board of the socialist journal, The Masses, until the government closed it down for its anti-World War I uh, articles, and then worked on the progressive literary journal, The Dial. Radical politics appealed to a number of progressive couples, notably Anna Rochester and Grace Hutchins, affluent women who met at an Episcopal retreat, but soon gravitated from Christian social action to support for the Communist Party. And I love the fact that these two rather prim looking women were, were active communists throughout their lives. After moving to New York, they moved into a third floor apartment at 85 Bedford Street, which is the building on the left. They remained committed communists until their deaths in the 1960s, even through a period when the Communist Party USA was purging homosexuals from its membership. Rochester and Hutchins simply did not identify with this group. They both wrote extensively about injustice, racism, and the problems of American capitalism. They wrote very loving romantic letters to each other. Uh, and they often used their substantial incomes to bail out or support other members of the Communist Party. The social reform efforts that so many of these women devoted their lives to was also what drove Lillian Wald in her efforts to improve the lives of immigrants on the Lower East Side at the Henry Street Settlement, which I will now turn it over to Katie uh, to, to, um, to fill you in on. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. So I'll, I'll just share my screen, give me one second. Can everyone see it okay? Okay, excellent. So Andrew was focusing on the turn of the 20th century, mostly in the early 1900s. And that is the same time I'm going to be talking about as well. Henry Street Settlement was founded in 1893. And this was during the progressive era and the settlement house movement was part of that progressive era reform movement. And I'll talk a little bit more about what settlement houses are in just a second. So Henry Street Settlement is an active social services agency located on the Lower East Side. And Henry Street has 18 sites around the neighborhood and serves about 50,000 New Yorkers every year in healthcare, social services, and the arts. And we were founded by a woman named Lillian Wald, who I think is not nearly as well known as she should be which was one of the reasons that we wanted to get this designation as an LGBT historic site. Even though we are already on the National Register, this just gives us another layer of significance that I think is really important to our history. So Lillian Wald was an activist on so many different fronts. She was part of the labor movement and the suffrage movement and fought for the rights of immigrants and African-Americans and founded a lot of the programs in New York City that still exist today that I'll touch on. And um, she was also known as a pioneer of public health nursing. So Henry Street Settlements headquarters is located on Henry Street and Montgomery Street on the Lower East Side. And I'll talk in just a few minutes a little bit more about these buildings, but um, this is our headquarters today and has been our headquarters since 1895, so dating back two years into our founding. 
So Lillian Wald was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1867, and her family moved to Rochester, New York um, when she was about 10 years old. And she grew up in a wealthy family. She was expected to get married, to have children and become a socialite. And she knew from an early age that she wanted to work. And one of the avenues that was open to her was nursing. And this really attracted to her because she knew that she wanted to help people. So she moved to New York City by herself and went to nursing school. And this is a picture of her at her graduation from nursing school. She actually also went on to medical school, but she didn't complete it because she decided to start Henry Street Set Settlement. And she tells this story in her memoir, which is called The House on Henry Street, about the spark, the idea for starting Henry Street. She was teaching a class on the Lower East Side, a homemaking class for immigrant mothers. And one day, a little girl who was about seven years old entered the classroom and told Wald that her mother, who was a student of Wald's, was dying in a nearby tenement, had just um, given birth, and the doctor who was caring for her had left because she couldn't pay the medical bills. So Lillian Wald followed this little girl to her family's apartment on Ludlow Street and entered the apartment and saw a three room space, about 300 square feet, 10 people living there, no water, no running water, no toilet, and it was very dark, and sees this woman who is her student lying on a blood soaked mattress, hemorrhaging after childbirth. And Lillian Wald was shocked by the conditions that she saw, but she gets to work right away taking care of this woman. And over the course of the next few days, she starts to get better. And Lillian Wald calls this in her memoir, her baptism of fire, which basically means this was her wake up moment, her wake up call. And she decided to leave medical school at this point and move to the Lower East Side and get right to work on providing free and affordable health care to especially the new immigrant population that lived in the neighborhood. So that baptism of fire moment happened in 1893. And in the 1890s, early 1900s, New York City was rapidly industrializing and becoming more urban and more and more crowded. And immigrants were arriving by the thousands every day to New York City. So the Lower East Side was referred to as the gateway to America because it was often a first stopping point for new immigrants mostly immigrants from Eastern Europe, a mostly Jewish population, and from Italy. So people came to this area for work in the garment industry and for the affordable housing in the tenements and for community that was forming in this area. But there were a lot of public health issues in the neighborhood. As I mentioned before, a lot of the buildings didn't have running water or toilets inside. And this area was extremely overcrowded. It was the most crowded neighborhood in the world at this time. And there were a lot of labor issues in the factories. People were overworked and underpaid and working in unsafe working conditions. So Lillian Wald moves to the neighborhood at this time. And at first she moves into a tenement apartment. And then she had this building in the middle building to the left, 265 Henry Street, donated to her by a man named Jacob Schiff, who was a philanthropist and a banker and a lifelong friend of Wald's. So she moves into this building, the middle building to the left. And then um, I'll talk a little bit later about the um, second building as well. So the other middle building, which is added on in uh, 1906 or becomes part of the settlement in 1906. And this is the settlement's headquarters. So Lillian Wald moves in here, and this is where all of the programming operates out, out of. And also um, about 10 to 15 nurses lived on site at, as well at any one time. So this is the idea behind a settlement house, was people mostly from affluent backgrounds, mostly born in the United States, and predominantly women, moving to neighborhoods like the Lower East Side, where there was a large immigrant or low income population, and providing direct services to the community. And the idea was to live alongside the people you're serving as neighbors and to be up close to the problems that they're facing. And Lillian Wald talks about, you know, with her being an outsider moving to this neighborhood, 
that she has to listen and respect what's already going on in the neighborhood and treat everybody with dignity and respect, no matter how much money they have. So she forms a nursing service and it's a visiting nurses service where these women are going into people's homes to take care of them, to break down barriers to accessing care. Um, barriers like language barriers or not having money for medical care, or they have to stay at home with their children or are working at home. So they're going to the people. And they start in the Lower East Side, but by the early 1900s, they're all over the city. And these, these nurses are referred to as public health nurses, and that means a lot of different things, but basically they are not just considering treating people if they're sick, they're considering the whole environment that's leading to people getting sick. So the fact that people are overworked and living in these housing conditions that I described before, all of these things are contributing to people getting sick. So they believed in addressing these other problems, not just providing this direct medical service. I love this shot of a visiting nurse in action, crossing over a tenement rooftop, going to any length to reach her patients. And here's a picture from one of the other branches of Henry Street Settlement. Um, it was called the Stillman House Branch, and it was based out of Midtown West, um, an area that at the time was called San Juan Hill. And in the early 1900s, this part of the city was the city's largest, had the city's largest black population. And the first African American nurse hired by Henry Street, Elizabeth Tyler, pushed Lillian Wald to open a branch of the settlement in this neighborhood to make sure that Henry Street was reaching people of color and African American communities throughout the city. So Elizabeth Tyler is definitely a pioneer within Henry Street's visiting nurses service. And they had all kinds of classes at the headquarters as well, cooking classes and English language classes and all kinds of clubs. This is showing an, um, a dance class and they had dance and theater and music and visual arts. And Lillian Wald also pushes beyond just direct service work and starts all of these programs in New York City at a citywide level with connections to the city government. So she starts the school lunch program in New York City and places the first school nurse in a public school. And the idea was similar that kids were going to school hungry or were going to school sick and then getting sent home and low income kids were falling behind in school. So this was to, um, to keep people in school and to help equalize. She also started special education classes in schools in New York as well. And um, you've seen the photo on the left already from Andrew. Um, Lillian Wald was very involved in the labor movement. These are pictures from the labor movement. The one on the right is actually right near Seward Park in the Lower East Side. And it is during the strike of 1909 that Andrew mentioned. So she was involved in getting labor laws and child labor laws. And again, part of the suffrage movement and fighting for the rights of immigrants and African-Americans. And she talks about how it wasn't enough to just provide direct service, um, that it also was essential to fight for structural change at the same time. So Lillian Wall did all of this work alongside people that she referred to as the family with a capital F, which I think is so interesting that she uses that term. These are the women who are supporting her on a daily basis. And some of the women in this photo, she had lifelong friendships with, she knew for many, many decades. She had, um, we also know of a few romantic relationships that she had with women who were associated with the settlement. And we know about these relationships from a historian named Blanche Reason Cook, who wrote about these relationships in the 70s, going through about 150 boxes of Lillian Wald's letters at Columbia University and New York Public Library and identifying these relationships as more than friendships. One of the people who she had a romantic relationship with was Mabel Hyde Kittredge, who helped her found the school lunch program in New York. And Mabel Hyde Kittredge was a socialite, um, lived uptown and then lived at the settlement for a short time. And then even after she left the settlement and after her relationship with Lillian Wald ended, which was very short, just about a year or so, 
she was connected to the settlement for many decades after helping with these um, kind of home planning um, workshops. And another one of Lillian Wald's romantic relationships was with a woman named Helen Arthur. And Helen Arthur was a lawyer and also lived at Henry Street for a time and also was very involved with the Art Center at Henry Street. So this is a picture of the Art Center on Grand Street, which is just about two blocks from our headquarters. And this was built in 1915 from the backing, with the backing of the Lewison sisters. And Helen Arthur was very involved from 1915 to 1927 in the Art Center while it was called um, the Neighborhood Playhouse. And the Neighborhood Playhouse then moved uptown after this. But our art center is actually still based out of that building. So again, so interesting that Lillian Wald calls these people her family, right? And this refers to a range of relationships that, you know, range from platonic to romantic. And she uses these terms in the letters um, that Blan Blanche Wiesen Cooks talks about. Um, she uses these terms studies and crushes to refer to this kind of range of different types of relationships. But it's really important that, um, you know, we recognize this part of our history of Lillian Wald, again, living in this homosocial world, this women-centered world that helped to build all of the programs that she went on to do. And this was very common in the settlement house movement that, um, you know, to find uh, lesbian relationships between settlement house workers, um, you know, not to at all, I think, take away from the amazing work that they did, but this also did provide them with um, a different way to live and not to have the pressure to get married. So I think that there can remain that nuance of, um, you know, this did provide a different kind of life for them. And Lillian Wald, as you know, uh, Andrew mentioned before, she wouldn't have used a term like lesbian to describe herself um, or a word like gay or queer, but that is likely how she would have described her identity today. So I'm going to just show you a few pictures of the inside of the headquarters at 265 and 267 Henry Street. And so the two kids are standing on the stoop of 265 Henry Street, and we're going to go in that front door. So as you enter, this is a picture from the present day, but it actually looks very similar to how it would have looked when Lillian Wald lived there. 265 Henry Street was built in 1827 and was built as a row house for a single family, a wealthy family, when the, that part of the city where this um, headquarters is was very different at that time. It was a wealthy part of the city um, before it was a working class immigrant neighborhood. And this banister, I wanted to show an up close picture because it is original to the building. If you go to the back of the building, you will see this beautiful garden. This is what it looks like now. And if you turn around, you see the back of the building and that is where Lillian Wald's bedroom is, where you see the porch. And that is called a sleeping porch. So since there was no AC, they would actually sleep outside. And when Lillian Wald lived in the building, her sleeping porch looked out over this playground. And there were kids in this playground from morning with an informal kindergarten to late at night um, when it opened up as a space for you know teenagers to socialize and for labor organizers to have meetings. And this gave Lillian Wald the idea to talk to the city government about building playgrounds in low income neighborhoods throughout Manhattan. And so Seward Park is actually the first muni municipally built playground in the United States. And it's just about three blocks away from Henry Street's headquarters. Back inside the building on the top floors are these little offices. Today they're offices, and they were previously the bedrooms of the visiting nurses. So about 10 of the visiting nurses would live on site. And the last space I'll show you is this gorgeous dining room. And this was a space that was used as a multi-purpose space for the settlement and where they would have 
you know, the visiting nurses would meet in the mornings and the evenings to discuss their cases. This is most well known for being the space where the civil rights organization, the NAACP, had their inaugural meeting in May of 1909. So people like Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois would have been there. And this group who met here went on to found the NAACP. So people from all over the world came to Henry Street to participate in conversations about public health and social reform and civil rights. So Lillian Wald was at the helm of Henry Street from 1893 to 1933 for 40 years. And then she, she retired and she passed away in 1940. I will end it there and then you can ask any other questions that you have and I'm happy to answer, you know, social history questions. Um, I think I will leave the architectural questions to Andrew, though, if you want to ask any questions about um, the inside of Henry Street settlement. And I want to thank the LGBT Historic Sites Project so much for helping with this nom nomination. Um, again, it just got passed at the state level and we are waiting on the national level. And I'll leave my email up here for just a second if anyone would like to get in touch um, to ever visit Henry Street Settlement or if you have any questions for me. Thank you all. Great, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have a, a comment here from someone who said that um, they grew up going to Henry Street Settlement but did not know the rich lesbian history. So I'm sure that adds a whole, whole new layer to, to a building um, that you've experienced. So that's what our project tries to do, to get you to look again at a, a building or street or a site that you may be familiar with, you can get it with a new lens. Um, we have a question, uh, let's see. Do we have any sense of what neighbors or community members who attended programs at the settlement knew about Lillian's sexuality? Yeah, so I don't know about, you know, uh, people who attended programs at Henry Street, if they would have been, if they would have known that she was a lesbian, but definitely people who were, you know, living at Henry Street would have been aware. And I, you know, I believe that she would have been open within her circle, but I don't really have a sense if community members would have known. Andrew, do you have any sense of that? No, you know, and um, responding to that, and so I noticed that there's another question uh, up here about whether there would have been sort of hate crimes um, against um, women involved in Boston marriages. And I think that the answer is probably no, because the the idea of women living together uh, was uh, was sort of a, an acceptable idea, um, mm -hmm. and and that you know people weren't imagining the romantic part of it. You know, I mean, we have to remember that that uh, you know there were there were fewer laws against uh, women's romantic relationships than men's romantic relationships because, of course, women didn't do that kind of thing. And so, since it was deemed accessible uh, acceptable for women to be physically uh, close to one another. Uh, I don't think that people actually looked askance at it. And I think this changed um, from what I can understand in the 1920s, sort of post, uh, you know, with Freud coming in and the idea of, uh, of, of the lesbian becoming a, um, a, a term. But until then, I don't think that, there was, that it was so much of an issue. You know, women just did that. Yeah, and actually, Andrew, the, one of our sites, the Eve, Eve's Hangout, calls to mind calls to mind what you just said um who is the, Eve Adams she went by the name Eve Adams operated a tea room in Greenwich Village in the 1920s and was arrested for allegedly attempting to have sex with a female police officer so that that's a site yeah that so it changed in the, in the 20s yeah um let's see we have a Victoria Monroe from the Alice Austin house Nice to see you here, Victoria. Um, have you been able to credit any of the photographs yet? I guess it's a question for Katie. From Henry Street? Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, I, I do have the credits for those photos. So if you are interested in any of the ones that I showed, 
um, in the presentation. I've, I'm the one who got them from the archive, so I do have the I have the credits for those. Happy to share that with you. Victoria is the um, executive director of the Alice Austin House. Alice Austin was a, a photographer, so she's into those credits. And actually, um, the nice tie-in between Alice Austin House and Henry Street Settlement is that um, in 2017, we worked with the Alice Austin House, the House Museum on Staten Island. If you have a chance to go, definitely check it out. Um, we worked with them to amend their national register listing to include the life of Alice Austin and her partner, Gertrude Tate. Um, and that was a Victorian era relationship through the 1950s. So then um, the staff at Henry Street reached out to us after hearing about that and, and wanted to reinterpret their history as well. So it was a great little um, domino effect yeah. between the two sites. And um, along the lines of asking about the photographs, uh, none of those are Alice Austin photos. Um, I've been trying to find a connection between Lillian Wald and Alice Austin and, you know, haven't find it, found a time when they overlapped in person, but it seems so likely that they would have met each other. I know that there are some Alice Austin pictures from the Lower East Side. Um, out of the ones that I showed, um, several of those were Jacob Reese photos and Jesse Tarbox Beals, who are, um, you know, from Progressive Era or well-known Progressive Era photographers as well. But. Yeah, and Alice Austin document photographed a lot of the working class life of New York City, so it would be interesting to see if there was some kind of connection there. Yeah. Um, there's a question. Uh, this presentation was amazing. Do you think that Henry Street Settlement would ever open its backyard area for a live fundraiser for your organization? I don't know if that's a question you can answer, but <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to. Wait, let me see. Oh, what it might be um, for your organization? Well, we do have. Um, you know, our programs across Henry Street, again, I mentioned, you know, we're still an active settlement today. And so our our different programs will use the backyard for all kinds of um, activities. So that does seem likely. Um, another comment, uh, Bravo, any connection with the work of Jane Adams in Chicago? Oh, yes, um, I meant to mention that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Lillian Wald and Jane Adams were good friends for many, many years. And we have documentation of um, Jane Adams coming to Henry Street several times. Also Jane Adams um, partner, Mary Rosette Smith, um, also, you know, wrote in our guest book as well. And, you know, the documentation of the relationship between Jane Adams and, and her partner, um, you know, they were together for, I think, about 40 years or so. So, it's it's really different to talk about um, you know their relationship of many decades and then Lillian Wald who we know that these two relationships that we, she had were just about a year long or so so it's a little bit harder to um, to talk about as um, you know to bring in that LGBT history. Yeah, yeah. I thought um, in connection with Adams and the whole settlement house, I thought it was really interesting working on this nomination with you all about the connection of uh, settlement houses and women's colleges as being really important places for women to gather, to meet each other and to organize. And it, it really became clear that this was a predecessor to you know, the women's liberation movement and like women, the women's movement in general that would, that would follow in the beginning in the world, post-World War I era and obviously through the 70s and onward. So it just gave women the chance to be together in a way they could not be before that, uh, in terms of thinking about public space and where women could and could not be. So that was a, a, a nice revelation yeah. during working on this nomination. Um, there's a comment here on Avenue D, there's a NYCHA development named after Lillian Walt, the Lillian, Lillian Walt houses. Uh, yes, and actually um, our co-director Jay Shockley also added the Lillian Wald playground and the Wald playground also on the Lower East Side named for, of course, Lillian Wald. It was one of a number of um, sites across the city that Jay looked at sites um, named normally intentionally or unintentionally for LGBT people and we have that on the website. Mm -hmm. um, question also, how did they get so many citywide programs passed? Was it easier for them then uh, it is to pass programs today. Was it easier for women to get programs built because they had money? 
probably there was um there there probably were fewer hoops for them to jump through in terms of getting funding um but also you know Lillian Wald really maintained her connections to um people in the city government and people who had money and political sway which is inter an interesting approach to her activism and was different from a lot of people who were working in the Lower East Side at the same time. So she knew people um, who were part of like the socialist movement, the anarchist movement, um, like Emma Goldman, and supported their movements. But um, she always maintained this connection of working kind of within the system, which again is a different approach to the activism. So. I know that she just had kind of these deep connections to city officials and um, you know to politicians. So I think that's how she was able to do that kind of work. But definitely the funding would have been allocated differently at that time too. So that would have been a difference to today. You know, I think that one of the things that's really interesting is the connections that she that she continued with the wealthy German Jewish community, uh, and that you know. She may have been doing radical things, but the buildings were funded and given to her by the Schiffs, the Loves, the Lewisons. So she maintained all of the, she she was brilliant in in maintaining good relationships with everyone. And when she needed something, she knew exactly who to go to. So if you needed you want you had this idea for school lunches, you knew who to go to that that could could push the levers uh, to to get that done. Uh, and then for Katie, could you say a bit more about Blanche Reason Cook's scholarship on Lillian Wald? How was it received at the time of publication in terms of her analysis of Wald's sexuality? I don't know how it was re received. Maybe somebody else on the call knows as well. Um, but I have had, I've actually had Blanche Reason Cook for a, um, as a panelist at a Henry Street event, but we didn't talk about this specifically. So I don't know. Does anyone else happen to know? Who's on the call? Okay. If anyone wants to um, read the article that she wrote, though, it is so good, and I'm happy to send it to you. So um, just email it to me, email me, and I can send it to you. Um, did Lillian live with a partner at the end of her life in Connecticut? No, she didn't. Yeah, so when she retired in 1933, she moved to Westport, Connecticut, and she had already had a house there um, before she officially retired. And she had really a robust yeah. life there in Connecticut um, for the last years of her life and an incredible community there, but um, no partner that, that lived with her that we know of. Um. I guess this could be a question for Katie and Andrew. Is it important or helpful to speculate about Eleanor Roosevelt's sexuality? Maybe more for Andrew, I guess, since you covered that. Well, wasn't it Blanche Wies? Is, is it Blanche Wies and Cook who wrote the, the multi-volume Roosevelt biography? Uh, and and you know, talks. You know, she she looked really into in detail uh, into to Roosevelt's um, letters and other things. And and uh, it's it's you know you know, generally recognized that she had relationships uh, with a number of women. Um, she, it, it is possible that she had um, a relationship with Marion Dickerman, um, one of the women that I talked about, uh, but, but her relationships with, with women is, is pretty uh, well known uh, today. And, and, I, and in response in, to the, the previous question, when, when, the, when, when Blanche Wiesencook's first volume about Eleanor Roosevelt that, that discussed her same-sex relationships came out, there was a lot of pushback uh, as to that. It was very controversial. You know, Lillian Wald is one thing, but Eleanor Roosevelt was a whole nother thing. I think it's been, we've been saying that the more prominent the person, the greater the pushback is, tends to be. Um, yes. And there's a question here, wondering if there was any conversations about anti-Semitism or homophobia? Uh, I'm not sure if that's talking about Henry Street or... You know, one of the things that's, uh, that has struck me as I, 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 as I helped uh, a little bit with the, with the National Register nomination was that, you know, Lillian Wald came from a, a relatively secular but, but 
still German Jewish background, but many of the other women that were at the settlement did not. They came from from um, American born, often Yankee backgrounds. Uh, and, and so there was an enormous amount of diversity among uh, the 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 nurses uh, and the others that worked there, even though they were working primarily in a community, uh, at least at first, uh, of, of Eastern European Jewish immigrants and some Italians. And then, of course, it diversifies, as we saw, with the, the Chinese and, and African-Americans uh, and, and others. But but um, you know, she 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 really flourished in in all kinds of society. Yeah, also, I, you know, Lillian Wald's family was Jewish, but um, she grew up in a very secular home. And I think that that was also part of her family, like trying to assimilate to the middle class American, middle upper class American um, community. So, you know, um, that really wasn't a part of her upbringing. Uh, and Victoria from the Alice Austin House notes that Blanche Wheaton Cook is now a board member at the Alice Austin House. So, oh, well. <laughs> you know, tidbit. Yeah, well, I think um, thank you for qu the questions, everyone, in the conversation. I um, Uh, let's see, so there's another comment. I love hearing about the networks that were built between the women. Do we know how their legacy inspired other generations? Hmm. I don't, but I hope we're all inspired. <laughs> I would say that um, I know there's uh, in the scholars on, on the subject of the settlement houses and women's colleges saying that the women in uh, Greenwich Village in the 1920s, like the more radical women of the day, they would have, that was kind of the next generation of, of women that were at places like Henry Street. So perhaps they were inspired in some way by these sort of trickle effects of just having that influence out there and seeing women organize and make change. Or even subconsciously, you see that kind of thing, and I don't know. Also, I guess I would add, um, you know, when Lillian Wald went to nursing school and started Henry Street, there was uh, no such thing as a social work degree, but these um, nurses were doing social work at the time that they were doing nursing. So, you know, the social work movement really sprung out of this as well. Yeah, and then we have um, a number of suggestions here of uh, further reading. Blanche's wife, Claire Koss, authored a one-person play titled Lillian Wald at Home on Henry Street. And then Lillian Faderman has also done some great writing on Jane Addams and on lesbian presidents of, uh, of uh, women's colleges. So there's further reading on the subject. Also, the, na the National Register nomination that we've um, collectively put together. It, when it's uh, released, there is a bibliography that was used to uh, put context to the Henry Street Settlement and the homosocial world that these women were part of, um, which is really an interesting source. Um, did queer women at this time associate with queer men? I'm assuming that's for Henry Street, but... Um. but I don't think so much on the, like at the settlement house. I mean, there were some men who were involved with the settlement house, but not living there. But um, I started a, actually a queer history walking tour in the neighborhood. And one of the sites is um, Bahala Hall, which is was a social club that was like a German social club that was very close by to Henry Street. It's from, um, from earlier, a little earlier though. And um, that was a space that was like radical women um, who were like part of the socialist movement and anarchist movement and also gay men um, all in the same space. So that's kind of one example that I know about. Um, so Alice Austin did uh, mingle with queer men is what Victoria is saying. And actually yeah, there are pictures in the Alice Austin house um, entry on our site and on the Alice Austin house website, they have way more photos of uh, 
and can see is uh, the life of the of her and her friends, including men. So I think um, I think that we should probably draw this to a close. We like to aim for about an hour. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us, uh, for Katie and for Andrew for sharing their knowledge with us. If any of you have further questions that you'd like to ask uh, Katie, Andrew, or the project, please feel free to reach out to us, info at nyclgbtsite.org. And I know Katie shared her email earlier. Follow us on social media, uh, check out our websites, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the new year with, with more programming. So thank you everyone for joining.